data for the Great Plains. Primary production, as you can think of, is forage production or biomass yield or something like that. And uh, these are isoplasts of those lines of relative variability between favorable and unfavorable years is what they call it. And you see, this is 0.9 here through uh, the central southern Great Plains, of course, northwestern Oklahoma and the Panhandle, right, is the highest in the Great Plains. And that's the Dust Bowl. You get over the eastern part and just barely, well, in fact, it doesn't, this lowest three tenths of a, three tenths of whatever it is, uh, doesn't even come through Oklahoma at all. So, you know, that tells us we've got quite a bit of quite a bit of variability. So you interpret that index there as it's a point nine indicates the fluctuations in production are ninety percent of the average. That'd be plus or minus. Uh, it just just emphasizes that you know the Great Plains is highly variable anyway. You know, everybody thinks about that. And I mean, you go to North Dakota and South Dakota, where I was in South Dakota back in the, in the early 80s, <coughs> modern stocking rate was really preached by everybody there. But, you know, their variability is quite a bit less than ours in terms of just year-to-year -year variability in production. Now, that's one of the interesting ones. Let's see if I've got this other one. Oh, here's something I used to, Marty, I don't know whether you, You've seen this lecture or not, but I used to, to lecture on this back when I taught principles of range management. It's the same kind of <coughs> same kind of curve that uh, that Eric showed you and, and Gary did, except I just I just added up the precipitation over periods of years. So I added up the you know those uh, plus and minus periods that Gary <coughs> and Eric showed you this morning. So this is just adding those years up, and this is just for Stillwater, Oklahoma, for the uh, National Weather uh, Station there. And you can see periods that range from six years, five years, 14 years. <coughs> Back in 2003, the last year that I put these data together, that was a 31 year period there. At that point, we had, we had accumulated <coughs> over 90 inches of additional precipitation above average that period of time. But some of them are remarkable because they're fairly short periods. You, you look at this 50 <coughs> inches at 61, that was after the drought. Uh, almost 50 inches of extra precipitation. Of course, that followed that 66 inches <laughs> where you lack them. And so Darren talked about how you don't just really bounce back on where you were before when you get this precipitation to resume to normal or above normal. And I think that's because drought effects accumulate. So you think about that uh, as being a part of in these dry periods. You know, you've lost you've lost two years worth of growth, uh, so to speak, in a 14-year period. That, that's going to take a, a lot of time to regain ground. Uh, just, this is just something similar to what Gary said. But, you know, Climate Data Center. This is an old figure, but I wanted to show it to you. It shows the tendency across the western United States, including the Great Plains, to have these groups of wet and dry years together. And you can see Oklahoma actually is, is kind of intermediate. So this is a coefficient of clumping. This, this area, the northern plains through the northern Rockies, tends to have the highest amount of clumping. And I recall when I went to South Dakota State, they had just pulled out a 15-year drought. And it's not a, unusual. You go back and look at the tree ring records for, for hundreds of years, and they have pretty typically 15 to 20-year periods, uh, where ours is tend to be less down here. Uh, well, you can see out in the northern plains, they might be a little bit more sensitive to, to moderate stocking rate because they, they've got to, got to be able to do that. I think that's all I want to show. Okay, so... One of the things I wanted the guys to talk about is, you know, the true definition of drought. I think it's pretty easy. That's, that you can define drought as this, right? When the cows are blowing on a windmill to get it to pump some water. <laughs> and you got a twice the size of a stock tank, too. 
That's true, isn't it? Yeah. Everybody's buying stock takes right now. Uh, Bigger immediate, ones. Immediate need to destock. So one of the things I want to get Dave and Darren to talk about in this panel is managing stock water. And I'll give you some reference materials. Dave suggested that might be helpful. Some just some places to go to for, for resources. Because you're probably getting those kind of questions. How many of you have had those kind of questions? You know, is there another way I can develop water? What can I do about drilling wells? Or you, know, you get those kind of questions. And that that's happening. I think probably as much with with uh, domestic water supplies, household water supplies off the well as it is with farmers and ranchers. From what I understand, uh, Oklahoma Water Resources Board, they're just deluged, that's a bad term to use in a drought. They're, they're deluged with, with calls uh, about wells running dry, about conflicts between neighbors, because one neighbor's pumping the aquifer dry, and it's the only source of water for a house. So I assume you're gonna have, you're having those, or will have those probably so with that, panelists, you guys come up here. I wanted to backtrack, though, before we got, <coughs> got into that and just talk to you about, I know stocking rate adjustment. <coughs> oh, where you guys want to sit? If you want to sit up here? Let's sit over there in the corner. In the dark. If you guys want to stock, talk about stocking rate adjustment a little bit more, uh, I think both these guys hit pretty good on that. But I'd ask you this, if you just down a list of what you learned this morning, what would be, let's say, three take-home messages? These are critically important things for me to remember, in fact, uh, for my stakeholders to remember, for my cattle. What, what would be maybe the top thing? And let's see, these are the graders, so they're going to grade you. That, there, that there's no good answer out there. No, no good answer. So one answer does not fit every situation. Okay. There's so many variables that they talk about, and things they didn't talk about that have to be considered. Good, Eric. What I heard Dave saying, if I could put it in economic speak, is um, manage to increase your options rather than manage yourself into a corner where your only option is to get rid of as much as fast as you can. Okay. I think another way that might we might when we talked about it on our way to eat is now more than ever you want to increase your options and your flexibility. Okay. And I'm going to talk more, a little bit more about that. You'll talk about that a little bit later, but we can do it now if you want. On the financial side. Don't want to steal any of your thunder. No, it's, there's no, no, no fact at all. No, I talked to Danny coming in the door. He made a couple of interesting. Oh, in the real world, I mean, it's the reality of the situation is, is what? Guys still got to pay taxes. Anything they sell, they get taxed, they get taxed on. You know, so, so and if they don't have an oil well or they don't have damages, you know, they probably already sold out of their cow herd. Those that's got enough money have went ahead and bought the hay. They've gone ahead and bought the cake. They don't have no grass right now, but uh, you know, they're they're selling down by half, by half, by half. You know, we another every year, every time it's changed. I mean, the '30s basically when you sold out the cows, the government became you got your property. I mean, that's how we got the national grassland, you know, and, uh, the, or you moved to, you, everybody jumped in the car and went to California, so basically the land was left dormant anyhow. And in the 50s, they figured it out in our country, they, uh, he was, his talking was correct, but he kept saying beef. Well, as they got rid of beef cows, they replaced them with dairy cows, and they dry a lot of dairy cows. And that's how they kept alive in the 50s. So, and we're going to revert to something different anyhow. It may be goats or something else because we're actually, you take I-40, I-40 now is eastern Oklahoma. 
y'all in Stillwater are getting a dose of western Oklahoma. And you're talking about a drought, and that's my average rainfall. And our management for years, there's still money can be made at 20 inches of rainfall, but you're going to have to cut the numbers back. You're going to have to feed cake, start feeding cake in June and July. I mean, I know y'all don't believe in 38% cake, and it's not economical, but you best get uh, ready to learn how to get a cake box. <clears throat> <laughs> well, I know, but you have you haven't you we never we didn't talk about me. You're not talking. You don't do it from July. I mean, it's a commonplace in Western Oklahoma to start in July and do that till yeah. March. You know. You so, you, so you're saying you think we're probably going to because I know one of the is, is especially for the eastern part of the state talking about reducing that length of the the winter feeding period. You're going to lengthen it. It's, it's going to lengthen back out by, by default. Yeah. Because it's a forage to, uh, dormancy issue. Uh, actively growing forage is compressed. Yeah. In fact, in 20, 2011, it was compressed to nothing <laughs> out here in Western Oklahoma. I, I think Terry Bigelow has told me he figures a lot of counties probably were at 10% average, which goes back to that. 0.9 on the index, 10% uh, of average forage production in 2011. That's not much. And so if you got 10% of the production, you have just a fraction then of the quality as well, right, Dave? That's true. It's the same quality, they fall together. Yeah. We're going to be working with younger producers because the older guys are gone. I'm curious what, uh, what has the recent oil boom done to this situation, it seems like. For our biggest problem is right there, the really oil boom, they're our biggest you know. competitors to the water. And I would say this year, if we maintain what we've had the last two years, and you know, hit a new formation in the Anadarko, Duncan area, uh, they're probably going to be moving. The rigs out here have been uh, trying to maintain, they've been drilling a lot of water wells and making big pits to hold the water. And then, you know, they, they're recovering their water, but uh, the water is getting ready to be the issue and probably will move more of the rigs towards where the water's at. Mm -hmm. And that's what they did when they moved out of West Texas. They moved into my area or our area to drill because they ran out of water down, mm -hmm. down in that area. Well, that's, it's sad around North Central Oklahoma. The Mississippi line is lim water limited right now. They're curtailing drilling. They're pumping. They're pumping water. Water. You know, most most of those contracts right now, you can get it where they'll drill. If there's any possibility of water, they'll drill. Pay to drill your well or water well, and then pay you 150 dollars a day for pump produce or the water off of it through the entire entirety of the well. But they're they're produce. They're pumping water through 10 inch lines as far as 12 miles in my area right now. 95 to 97 percent of all the ponds in my county are dry. What percentage of your beef cattle producers would have direct income from the recent oil boom? Most. Most of them would? If so we didn't have the oil play in our country, it would be bad. Really bad. Yeah. I mean, taking the water <coughs> deal out, I mean, because whether you've got direct oil play or not, you know those guys that's got big checks and, and leases or whatever. I mean, they're putting it in the fence building, you know, uh, corral improvement, and there's guys out there that's working and running a few cows that's got a job building fence or building corrals for them or doing this and that. So, you know, it's helping the whole ag industry. I mean, really, if the oil field wasn't there, I, I you know, I'd hate to be in Ellis County. So as far right as their motivation to fine tune their management on beef cattle is probably pretty low priority, isn't it? If they have big oil checks coming in. Yeah, it, it kind of shields it some, but you know, the good guys, they're still trying to take care of the grass. Yeah, they're trying to protect the grass. So they're, they're and you know, it's just been so dry out there, Dave, that whether you you can't shield it all. I mean, they, 
they've had everybody sold the cows. I, I don't know of anybody that hasn't yeah. participated. Yeah, well, all I'm saying is, yeah. that, you know, the business about, like Darren said, having to pay the, yeah. having to pay the, you know, the annual payment or whatever, probably is not a terribly big issue for a lot of the people in Northwest of a lot of them, but there's still a few out there. But like I say, they're making income other ways. You know, maybe not directly tied to the oil field, but the oil field supplying that money for what they're doing to help <coughs> offset their their deal. Capital that's coming in. Capital that's coming in. Yeah, the capital that's coming in, and other producers are, are spending it, and they're they're reaping the benefits. And then some of them's got jobs in the oil fields. You know. It's not like the 30s and 50s where we're going to have to sell the lands, basically. I mean, that's we're going to be able to maintain that this time around. We're not going to probably increase the size of the national grasslands but, uh, like we did in the 30s. And the, the <coughs> they're going to be able to maintain the property. They're going to, I mean, the values won't be coming down anytime soon. It's just that <coughs> we're getting more and more calls or I do get more and more calls from land leasers and uh, those that got cattle on leases, their land leasers are calling and, and they're just coming to see them once a year and they're saying, how come are they butchering up my land? You know, they're skimming, that part's getting a little tougher. You know, I talked with one from Florida and I asked him, I said, uh, when was the last time you looked on the map to see when we got a rain in this country? Has nothing to do. He may have one cow in the whole place. We didn't grow no grass last year. It ain't his fault. You know. And the bankers in our country are struggling too because you know they make money by loaning money, and you know the oil play. You know, I've I've heard comments of guys you know a year ago of <coughs> pushing a million dollars, and now they got a million in cash sitting in the bank. You know, and the bank don't make, you know, they're, so, so the bankers are kind of whining too, so. The bankers are whining? Yeah. yeah they're, they're not whining. making, they're not making money, I mean. They're not they're, loaning. So yeah, they're not loaning, loaning money. Well, why the bankers a good thing, all right? Yeah, that's true. Okay. That's true. I well, mean, it's so. They're whining things. for a different reason. Yeah, and, you know, they're still a good, but like uh, production credit stuff out in our country, their, their annual income has been a lot lower the last year or two than it normally is, you know, and and they're not mad, I mean, they're just, yeah, that's, you know, it's part of the business. But. Loan volume nationwide is <coughs> way down for banks. They they are really struggling to find places to lend money to. People just are not taking out loans, so that's not just, be, I wouldn't say that's just because of the oil patch, but that's that's a huge issue in the banking sector everywhere right now. That's why you're, when you put it, your, your bank and your bank is paying you .0007% on your, on your uh, checking right now because they can't loan it back out to anybody. So what, what percent of the cow herd has been reduced out here more or less? Beckham County is about 62%. 62% of what it was? Mm -hmm. I'd say Beckham County is 50% or bigger. May 1st, 2011. <laughs> <laughs> 50 plus so yeah. we'll be down another I mean we'll lose another half of half it's going to go to 75% so we're going to be about 75% probably if if we just have what we had the regular spring last year uh -huh. we'll be at 75% yeah, I, kind I'll step up there in the office doing the figuring on everything that's kind of what I I did some, some calculations up there at the end of last week, you know. I mean, kind of from a forage production standpoint, best case scenario, it takes about 25 <coughs> gallons of water to grow a pound of forage. Okay? So if you pencil that out a little bit more, that's about three and a half, three and a quarter, three and a half acre inches to produce a ton. 
okay? So, you know, that's that falls in line with a lot of the, the rules of thumb that we've had going on for, for several years. But now that's just, you know, that doesn't account for evaporation and, and, and runoff. runoff and all that other kind of stuff either, okay? So, you know, yeah, I think if you take those into account, it's it's probably going to be somewhere up around probably six, seven, or eight inches. So I don't know if you look on the on the mezzanine, there's summer evapotranspiration is about a quarter to three tenths of an inch per day. Is that you know that's that's a pretty good couple inches a week. You know there, so it, it takes a lot of water just to kind of maintain what what you got once you get it produced. <clears throat> you know, so that's that's the situation that we run in. When we start off with no subsoil moisture, there's, there's, I mean, yeah, that's a, you got a long road to hold when you're starting off there. Like we were two years ago. We're, we're pretty close headed that direction this year, but it, we watched, they had the new weatherman in there going and, and, oh, you know, he's talking great, wonderful rain coming up for the next couple of days, you know. Two inches in some places, so. It's been a long time since anybody's had two inches of rain that I know about. You guys haven't had two inches out here in a couple of years added up, have you? No. You know, so. Here's the thing that just scares me, okay? We're, <clears throat> we're at the two-year mark. We finished two going into three. Texas, the Panhandle of Texas, was the two years back when Greg and I got to watch the lines hit the interstate of the trailers from the hysteria that if you really check back on had to do with city municipalities shutting off the 40 communities in Texas any water leaving the city limits. When we're setting out here with the water situation at the municipalities right now and reality hits in May that we don't have enough water to supply our cities what kind of hysteria will that take place on the livestock industry? Are we looking at the same scenario? Is Oklahoma City and Tulsa going to be ramshackled by a bunch of cows in June or July? Well, no, because we've already seen that already this morning. You know, that's already happened. You know, they, they've got about all they can get right now <coughs> until something else happens. You know, so it's, it's the, no, it, you know, the, the cities are not going to be, they'll be the last ones affected, that's what I'll say. Well, the, the, the city part of it affected it when the cattle guys realized that they didn't have that second option there following the little water from town to get them through the two or three days the windmill didn't run. Mm -hmm. so, so I don't want to, you know, kind of half jokingly a little bit ago, you know, learn how much <coughs> water a cow drinks. How much water does a cow drink? Oh, at the gestating cow, around seven gallons a uh, year, and lactating cow, 10 to 11 in the winter, and you can almost double those in the summer. Maybe, maybe 12, she produces a lot of milk, so 44 in the summer, 12 in the winter. So, lactating cow in the summer, 24 gallons a day. And then another 20 gallons of evaporation out of the tank. Probably, yeah. So you get pretty close to Darren's number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so you're you're talking about plus you have seepage in a pond, so yeah, and that can be uh, huge. Seepage can be more than that. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about hysteria. twice now to cut back on our water consumption by 40 percent and what's what's happening is you know a lot of the smaller farms around there have had to go a long time ago to watering their livestock with rural water and now they're asking you you have got to get the livestock off of the water source because it's peak water <laughs> and so people are either either they're just ignoring it or selling their livestock for that reason and or 
point to where it all comes ahead is rapidly approaching because everybody's, you know, the people who still do have livestock in that rural water district are having to use the rural water. And so, I mean, it just, it's just going to... Yeah, I think we could literally, I think we could easily see that in Oklahoma City metropolitan area. Uh, I don't know that Gary said it, but we talked to him about that. Uh, that isn't Oklahoma City extremely unwise to plan for normal precipitation that would refill lakes this coming spring. And he said based on the forecast, he thinks that's extremely wise. He agreed. So it might not be just long chimney. It's, it's on a roll of So David, how much, how much during a one or two year drought does the aquifer recede and replenish in an oil? I mean, how, how variable is it just based on rainfall? It depends on the aquifer. So one of the issues on, <coughs> see what Dave's asking is, what, how, how much does the aquifer fluctuate? Uh, the alluvial aquifers, where uh, uh, those western Oklahoma City municipalities, some of them take the majority of their water, they fluctuate a huge amount. In fact, they can just flat out go bone dry. They haven't yet, but they're certainly way down. And there's a number of those wells that have gone dry. <coughs> uh, so what you see, if you go over uh, the uh, any of those rivers and look, you're seeing the base flow, and that's that's reflective of that saturated zone and that alluvial aquifer. And so it is it has dropped that amount. <laughs> so they're having to pull water from the deepest part of that, and it's really restricted. On the other hand. It does, uh, it does re refill rapidly with rainfall and then stream flow. One of the issues on that though, in fact, this has happened on Canton. I didn't see them say that this time, but the USGS, a year ago this past September, remember they took a, a withdrawal out of Canton? It was, I think late September. The USGS said, well, don't do it now. If you don't have to, wait until we get two, two inch rain. Because if, if you withdraw to begin with right now, it'll just go into that stream bank. So you'll reduce the, the amount delivered to uh, Hefner by 30 or 40 percent. So wait, and then fortunately they did get that that rainfall in, in late September and October, and then they released the water. They didn't do that this time. And you're going, you know, that doesn't even make sense at all. And what, what you said or Gary, that we were still at 60% lake capacity in Oklahoma City and their lakes, so they didn't have to have this. But they're depending on it now with no serious rationing or conservation measures. So it's a serious concern. Let me just say, though, oh, by the way, so Norman and their aquifer, uh, the Garber-Wellington, which is, some of you may have some garbage wellington, but it's it's ten thousand to twenty thousand year recharge. So you know, say, say that again. It's ten thousand years to twenty thousand year recharge. You could be a little low. So is it you know you deplete that one? It's it's, it's a lot less than the old law of the panhandle, but it's still a long period. So it's ge you know not geological water, but close to it. I guess it may be considered twenty thousand. These alluvial aquifers are the ones that I think that we're really going to see competition from, and I believe they're over permitted. And you probably have folks in your counties that are using that water. Uh, water Resources <coughs> Board doesn't require you to have a permit if you're a homeowner and just using that for municipal water supply and to garden with. But. The suspicion is there's a lot of truck farmers that are doing, you know, uh, local uh, farm uh, sales and irrigation off of those wells that are competing, as well as the Ocinos, <coughs> Piedmont, et cetera, taking water out of, out of that North Canadian River. But that's a pretty good gauge. You just look at that base flow this time of year. It's just been low like that, you know, now for really three years. The Washita had run for three years, so <coughs> off. And 
the faucets do a majority of the water in this entire area and all the city municipalities and planning and, and all around are hooking on to FOSS. So. And the only, the, the, the one thing different between the 30s and 50s and now, remember a while ago you said trees? Western Oklahoma didn't have those trees eating up all the, along creeks and rivers. And I'm right now, ask. the only yes. time creeks and rivers are coming up is when we, the trees go dormant. And uh, we didn't have these trees. And uh, hopefully after this drought's over with, we don't have these trees. Anybody going to be at the in-service next week on Wednesday in Oklahoma City for uh, Larry Sanders, Red Cedar, <coughs> Red Cedar water use in-service? Probably not. We're going to talk about the impact of Red Cedar, how much water it does use, uh, and then and discuss some of the policy implications. Secretary Reese will be there, and he'll be talking a little bit about state policy. I just had a, a question and we'll finish up. So what, <coughs> one way to look at this, I, the drought is definitely devastating. It has all these negative things that we've been talking about all day today, but it also presents an opportunity. And Terry Bidwell and I and a couple others are, have plans to visit with Oklahoma City uh, utilities and maybe you know, wherever we can go with that and say, hey, you realize how much water Red Cedar is using that, that is really capturing your water? And you also spend hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars a year in fire suppression because of Red Cedar. You know, burn up 1,200 homes and all that kind of stuff. Would you be interested in strategically removing Red Cedar from the watershed, from Oklahoma City's watershed, to release water and reduce your burden for, for uh, fire suppression? And we'll see where that goes. But it definitely would, would have a difference. Play, play in effect. We, we don't have all the answers right now, especially for Western Oklahoma. The study that we're basing in Oklahoma are outside of Stillwater, but uh, the figures that they're saying is between seven gallons a day and as much as 70, I think it's 70 or 80 gallons a day of water use per tree. Now, grass uses water too, so they're, they have to factor that in, you know, the, the, the uh, trade off. How, how many of just show of hands? How many of would have landowners who would be well? You think would be willing in participating in a, a water release management of red cedar if there was an incentive, copay, something like that from Oklahoma City? Just we've already got that started to the North or the Canadian to El Reno, but they can't find the, the funding. They've <coughs> already done it from the state line back to the Amarillo Lake. And who's, who's, sick, huh? who's organizing that? Uh, it's uh, the North Canadian, I can't, North Canadian, uh, but they're also throwing in salt cedar control, oh, yeah. which makes that little cedar tree look like a little bitty stepchild of the consumption of water salt cedar can consume. And they're well, trying to do that. Interesting enough, our department head in NREM is a salt cedar water use specialist, or at least he was, he published a study that came out of West Texas, but it showed that the salt cedar didn't use any more water than the replacement vegetation, which boggles the mind. You know, everything you've ever heard, it's a free adified taps the groundwater and all that, but now that may not hold for Oklahoma, but that's kind of been a, a broad brush sort of thing. Let me ask you one other thing, and why don't we get into I wanted these guys to talk about water for, for livestock and uh, the, the opportunity folks have right now to clean ponds out. Anybody see folks cleaning out ponds? Yeah. Try to. <clears throat> okay, you see any common, common mistakes there that you can correct uh, through education? Bidwell always points out to me, we drive around the country, says, well, look at that. They put the filter on the upside, <laughs> on the watershed side of the pond instead of down. So basically, you're putting wa the wash it back in. Wash it back right back in. So that's a common, a common I mean, mistake. Uh, we had at our, at our North Range, we had NRCS design two clean ponds for us. I mean, we were just going to clean them out. Don't do that. Just go. Don't do 
farms? Well, no, they, they actually use the same site, but um, we went ahead and built a fence around it, put a pipe through the dam, put a cross, cross creek tank behind it. Before. Guess which farms were the first ones to dry up? Those. Those. You know, they just did, they just would not, and I kept asking them, I said, don't make it so broad, make it smaller and deeper, deeper. But they, 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 it didn't meet their specs or whatever. You know, I don't know at what level <laughs> those folks could be uh, encouraged to consider some difference. Did they put a clay liner in the yeah. bottom of it? I'm sorry? But did they put clay in the bottom of the yeah. pond? So it, was, it wasn't leakage, it was evaporation. evaporation. No, I, I wouldn't have any way to. You know, All you know is it had water in it. All I know is they were the first ones to dry out, or at least, at least the one. I probably encourage you to talk to the owners of this. Mm-hmm. The reason why I've done, I always say, somebody asked me, I always say, well, the NRCS has them designed for you. You, you know, you got your own dozer operator, whoever, you know, is, is constructing the pond, but I've seen some real mishaps on pond construction, like it's just not, the, uh, the dam's not correct constructed properly so it washes out in a big rain mm-hmm. and you have dam the dam failure or maybe even causes a huge gully downstream. I've seen that happen. Washed out one of our fences one time. The neighbors did because we had, had a pond on the fence line and not only did it create a huge gully, we had no fence <laughs> and no place to put a fence. So to back it up further on our property. Uh, but that's a concern. It was just, and I think one of the issues yeah. there you ever talk to your, your district NRCS folks? I know this case around Oklahoma City, Tulsa. That's 90% of their work is pond design. You know, they, they're just full of work holes. So in hindsight, would you have cleaned it out? Just just gone in and cleaned out those ponds? Uh, I don't, do you remember, Dan, did they actually provide the specs that the dozer company followed? I, I, I thought they did because yeah, they out uh, they, they came out and surveyed and, and signed off on it prior to completing the project. So I mean at the time I mean it just it didn't look deep enough at the time and so we I mean or I encouraged them a couple of times to mm-hmm. uh, consider digging it deeper. And then the other problem I had was placement of the in ground water tanks concrete water tanks. Heck, it, it wasn't even very dry and, and water wouldn't fill one of those water tanks. So I think placement of that water tank was in the, was in the wrong spot as well. So. The, the drawdown too? Yeah, the draw drawdown too. And, and the NRC, CI, uh, NRCS, I think we had to place it like 50 yards away from the pond to get proper slope or something to that tank. So, so I, I don't know. We did have some problems there. Well, they do have really rigid slope restrictions on the ponds for safety sake. Well, that's what I was going to ask. I mean, what is there, a, is there an engineering problem with, or a soil type problem with going digging one too deep? I mean, I just, I don't understand why they won't. They well, won't the, uh, some, in some places, if you hit it so deep that you get down into the rock, then you can't seal it. You can't keep the water in it. I see. Out there, I guess it'd be fractured. We've seen that on some of them that they've gone in and cleaned out. Mm-hmm. You cleaned them out so deep, then they, never, they wouldn't hold water after And they wouldn't that. hold water after that. Yeah. So that, that's an important educational. Mm-hmm. How many of you think that you know cleaning out ponds is an opportunity? You see that, maybe more people, anything with pond? 90, 90% of the upstream flood control ponds in this whole part of the state need to be cleaned out. They're, right. they're, past they're past all, they're right. all so filled. Filled in. Problem yeah. is there's no money for that. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> no, and they're really known that could cost. They've done the experiments in my, in my county on a couple of the original where, where they started the flood control and most of that region <coughs> to meet the standards now is going to cost like, I mean if there's a house behind it costs three to four million dollars to do the damn work 
And if there's another <laughs> house behind it, it's going to be a million plus. So it's not lightweight chunk change to, to, to fix those uh, control dams. And they're still setting. We've been, they've been fighting now, trying to get the, the state of Oklahoma to match it. Because the feds money's there if they can get the match from the state. And uh, that's not come through for a number of years yet. Uh, it's going to take millions. I had a meeting with, uh, I don't know what we were talking about, the water policy meeting, concentrating the other day, and the director from the Oklahoma Water Resources Board was there. And uh, Brad Tipton asked him, you know, why aren't they dredging out some of these lakes while they're down? And he said, uh, wasn't the cost that plenty of money, we could clean them out anytime we want to. It's the federal red tape. He said there's uh, he listed a number of agencies they had to go through. It's considered a pollutant. There's no place to put it. They have no place to, and he said it's just a, it's just a federal red tape nightmare to dredge out a lake. And he said that's the reason they're not any of them being dredged out. He said it's not the money. We got the equipment with money. We could dredge them out of town. So we just can't, we can't get through can't all get the federal paperwork. How about uh, water quality? I want to ask these two guys uh, about water quality and any questions you have on that, any comments about <coughs> water quality and ponds? Well, I think that last figure I showed today kind of indirectly alluded to that water quality standpoint that, that having some residue on the, on the soil surface is going to clean that water up a little bit. You know, it's not going to make it completely drinkable running off the field. It's certainly going to reduce a lot of that silt and potential <coughs> and a lot of the turbidity issues that are caused from, from some of that runoff. You know, the other thing you got is erosion potential if you don't have it there. I mean, there's, there's, you know, that water quality thing seems pretty simple until you start, start really thinking about it. I know on the some of the some of the, the pond cleaning there will be some opportunities there to uh, all go in and, and kind of restrict access to a lot of those those ponds so that they what they make a little narrow alley down there and they'll typically put some coarse gravel in there so that it's painful to walk down there and get a drink so they don't stay gone there you know just get a drink and get back out of there they're not loitering around in the, in the ponds and that sort of thing. I mean, there's, you know, it's, it's. So, so let me ask you this. How, how many of you see restricted access to ponds at, at all? I've driven up and down the roads, tried to count them before, and it's really minor. You forget what you were doing counting. There's a few of them probably. There's a few of them, yeah. And really, you think about water quality as well as uh, uh, staying silt free or, or Soaking up, that's the number one thing that you can do to protect the pond is restricting access. And it seems odd that we don't do that. So, what, what, what percent of you guys are, are out of uh, stock tanks or the windmill tanks? Mm -hmm. Are out of them. That are watering cattle out of stock tanks. Right now? Well, now, if, if everybody. 100%? 100%, yeah. 100%? 100% out of stock tanks or. <coughs> yeah, they're, they're there is no pond water on the creek water, water, water. Okay. Yeah. Normally, normally, what would be the percentage? You say pre pre 2010. 25, 30. Yeah. yeah. 75. 75 percent yeah. pond water. Yeah. No, no. Okay. Well, sand hills. Yeah. Sand hills. You don't. Yeah, yeah. Not much choice there. Yeah. To get those ponds cleaned out is is going to be huge. I've got a question for Dave. What are the long-term effects of cattle drinking these high salt level waters? That we're getting lots of it out of the way because aquifers are going down, salt contents are coming up. I'm not sure I can answer what the long-term consequences are. I mean, cattle can, for the most part, handle quite a bit of, of all the different kinds of salts um, and get along pretty well. So I don't know that there was necessary. I mean, like if you go from 500 that have a long-term impact or do permanent damage to organ tissue or whatever? Um, I don't really think so unless you're talking about high levels of nitrates or over 500 parts per million sulfates, something like that. But it wouldn't be long.
long term, you'd see those effects within the first 15 months. See, some of the levels of my pond, or some of the levels were soft tanks in my area, because we're getting down there. We were at 2,500 on sulfur, and I'm getting readings up to 1,000 now. And that's why we're having to go to and recommend in several of them to start using mineral and vitamin injections because the immunity of the RKFs coming out of some of my area is going that way because of copper deficiency and everything that's being locked up with the sulfur. And uh, so some of the vets have been recommending when we're weaning our calves that we need to be given a vitamin mineral shot. And what we're seeing when they, right after they give those, they go to consuming minerals and vitamins like crazy. And, uh, you know, I talked to some of our producers. As this salt level's gotten up, of course, I'm at 1,500 normally at 2,000 in a lot of my tanks out there. And now we're bumping 1,000 parts on sulfur. That's pretty high. <laughs> we're playing really with some high. stuff that, you know, and to be honest with you, as the creeks fill up in my country, I'm, and the wheat pasture goes together, we're seeing some blindness and things like that. My guys are getting pretty good with knowing that they're not seeing blindness because of it's a sulfur situation. So it's a different world playing with it. I, I think maybe the one thing that might get at your question a little bit, I think the, if it really looks and smells nasty, it does to the cow too. Whether it's fecal material or dissolved salts or whatever, they are drinking less of it. And so. And they will do less. And they, and they will eat less forage, and they will gain less weight, and they will be thinner in the fall, and on and on and on. At what point is that? Because we've got a lot that's 12,000 plus. I mean, the cattle will drink the water at all. 12,000 plus total dissolved salt. Uh-huh. Wow. Yeah, I wouldn't think they would drink it. I mean, they won't, they won't even drink it. I mean, yeah. I mean like, you know, will they drink 6,000? Will they drink 7,000? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, Ten thousand. Well, no, it's way lower than that. But uh, yeah, if you read the, the table, says at about three thousand. You know, thousand is really no big deal. Three thousand. You know, they're going to start turning those stuff out, and you're going to start seeing some diarrhea and things like that. Six thousand. You're going to start having some problems. All the trace minerals are going to be tied up. You're going to have lots of diarrhea. Probably some anemic uh, situations. Here's another thing that you'll see. When the grass is all dead, and that's high in salt, and uh, you think that, you keep talking about them cow pies standing up, and you see them, uh -uh. high salt will make their, high salt, those cows will have beautiful brown, look like they're out on wheat pasture, uh, manure patties out there. They won't be standing up. <laughs> it's a laxative. Yeah. I even had a deal, not this, not this winter, but the winter before. Not much pond water around. The migration of ducks through. Had ducks get so heavy on a pond that they fouled it so bad that we lost cattle. Mm -hmm. have, to, have to put a net across those ponds. <laughs> yeah. Are wasn't a problem this this yeah. winter because there's no yeah, no the water in it. Yeah, it's just cattle bogging down and drowning in them yeah. because uh, yeah. that sediment is so thick and yeah. deep. I think we had some cattle sinking up to above the brisket just trying to get to the water. Yeah. Uh, so what do you do with, when you clean out a pond? What do you do with all that sediment? Is it fertile? Will it ever be fertile? How do you manage it? Where do you put it? I've been putting it out on the grass, out away from the dam in my country spreading it out, just like you do soil farming. That's, That's a bad it. term to use, soil farming. I didn't say that. <laughs> uh, there's no property left in Roger Mills that hadn't already been soil farming. Ellis is almost to catch us. They may be surpassing us. No comment? How many acres you reckon you got in your, con your, your county there, Justin? Several. One or two? Huh? So far? Oh, yeah, sir. Um, <coughs> talking about drilling mud. Yeah. Eric, have we used our time? 
populations and all that other stuff I mean it, it's a good time right now to be cutting the trees off the dams and all that kind of stuff and cutting the trees away from all the ponds so they quit consuming all the water and that kind of deal but we what are we going to do to get them back and back right we do have a fact sheet on managing ponds for livestock wildlife and fish I think but that's probably like typical man yeah management when it's full management when it's full or yeah. How many of you convinced that we're going to go through 10 to 20 years of below average precipitation? Average to below average? Or below average. So you look at what Gary was showing us today, uh, will we be above or primarily below in those uh, La Nina years? Below average. How many of you hope it'll be normal? I think everybody's really concerned about it. It's probably a good reason. Any, any, any uh, last comments about long-term adjustments? What, what do you see in the next, say, the beef cattle industry, maybe even agriculture in West Oklahoma in the next 10 years? Big change. They've already said smaller, some smaller uh, caps. Cow size will decrease. Anything else? <laughs> mark, mark changes that you think will take place. Fewer cows. Fewer cows. Fewer cows. And smaller ones. <laughs> I think I'll have a lot of guys wish they had native range instead of old. Yeah, that, that's, that's, I, I, I thought that exact same thing, you know. You know, it, it looks good on a wet year and the fertilizer works, but on a dry year it don't It's look the great. same as, it's the same as the native range. What was the comment, Justin? I'll have a lot of guys wish they had more native range and less old world blue yep. mm. how old, old Pat McElvain from Woodward used to say ARS station say range native range is your life uh, I guess in the 50s and 60s we had a lot of love grass go in because of the drought and then when you have a dry year that's one thing they have to eat so we'll probably see a bunch of love grass yeah because it comes on early and takes advantage of early moisture that's a good work day I was just going to ask you how long the old blue Some of you water guys dry, know water dry is that now. 2017. It'll be done. Oh. Yeah, it's going to be short lived. Looks like. Well, it's been. It started in 2000, probably 2005. So it's not short lived. It's going to be. It was seven years in the 80s, and this is going to be about a dozen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's probably. It's, it's a different energy environment. Different environment. 